Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Yong Wee. Uh, I'm one of the teachers that's uh, teaching the Book of Jonah, and uh, so far it has been a struggling experience for me. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll be conducting the uh, lesson on Jonah chapter 3, the first part. So uh, let me just forward the slides. Okay. Uh, okay, we, let me see if I can click the mouse. Uh, on the right, okay. into the right. Okay, so okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you want to zoom in for that? Uh, okay, I just want to click this. Okay, uh, sorry. Let me just. Uh, okay, you you can scan this QR code. So probably we can do it in groups. Uh, scan the QR code and enter the class ID 44549, yeah, 44549. So you will uh, be able to follow the sequence of the slides. Uh, unfortunately, we, we have a limitation of like 25 in a class. It's, uh, this is an in-class uh, uh, app, uh, which, which is a free version. So, <laughs> so yeah, so I appreciate you can gather in the groups and then just uh, one of the the leaders or someone in the group, you can do the scan because later there's some discussion so we can uh, also use this to facilitate the discussion. Okay, so if you have already done that. Okay. So let me just close this. Wow, okay, a bit challenging, but. Uh, okay. So, uh, before we begin the class, uh, maybe we do a recap on last week's lesson. Uh, last week, we covered Jonah chapter 2 on Jonah's prayer. And uh, we mentioned that the prayer itself is filled with uh, imagery, uh, poetic metaphors, uh, uses uh, words like temple, mountains, uh, deep sea. And we introduced a new word or maybe an unfamiliar word, uh, the word called Sheol and what does that actually means, right? So if you still remember uh, last week's lesson, so what is the first word that comes to mind when you think of the belly of Sheol that um, Jonah actually prayed? So let me just see if I can move the mouse again. Okay. Oh. <gasps> okay. Okay, so uh, in your app, you will be able to enter your work cloud. So you can enter as many, I think, up to three or five. Uh, what is the first word that comes to your mind, all right, when you think of the belly of Sheol? Yeah, because this, this word is uh, unfamiliar to most of us. Uh, however, to the ancient Hebrew, so when they hear this word, uh, they associated the word with something else. So the metaphor is uh, pretty, pretty strong. Yeah, so let's take a look at... Uh, okay, so we are seeing uh, words like death, darkness, Despair, uh, deep, in between heaven and hell, okay, scary, uh, loss of pain, suffering, heart of the sea, okay, uh, smelly, okay, I'm not sure if I smelly, but uh, okay, interesting description, uh, fish, okay, um, yeah, and uh, despair, okay. So, thanks for your participation. Uh, let's see. We can, we can, uh, let's be close to submission. And then probably, uh, what stars? Okay, let me just see again. Okay, okay. So, uh, you, you get participation points for that. Uh, it's hard to control, but. Okay, so uh, yeah, when, when Jonah is, uh, he was in the belly of the fish and he prayed to God 
And that was the experience that he uh, that surrounded him. And he uses metaphors uh, such as the Valley of Sheol, such as I'm uh, surrounded by waves, uh, I'm in the deep. All right, to express a very emotional, very uh, uh, difficult, despairing position that he was in. All right, and he cried unto unto God for help, and God rescued him. So that was uh, uh, the prayer. Okay, so what are we learning today? So today's lesson is in Jonah chapter 3. And uh, there are two objectives for our lesson today. One is to appreciate the ambiguity and interpretive challenges in Jonah's message uh, to the Ninevites. Okay, the Ninevites, uh, the Ninevites, um, when he preached in the city, all right? And to appreciate God's mercy, his desire for repentance, and the potential of trans transformative change in the face of uh, imminent uh, judgment. So uh, if you have the Bible, can you turn to Jonah chapter 3? Uh, we will read the 10 verses. And after that, I will just uh, say a prayer uh, before we the start of the lesson. So Jonah 3 verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Three days' journey in breath, Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Let us go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for yet another opportunity where we can come to study your word. Father, we want to ask that we don't just read the words as is or at its face value, but to be guided by your Holy Spirit. So may you speak to us through your Holy Spirit to help us comprehend the depth of your words such that, Lord, we can be transformed and be changed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. We ask for your presence to fill us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Okay. <clears throat> so key learning points uh, for chapter 3 here is uh, uh, salvation belongs to the Lord. And this is the last sentence that Jonah prayed just before the fish vomited him out uh, onto the shore. So he actually said salvation belongs to the Lord. But we will experience a contradiction in chapter 3 or chapter 4 Right, where Jonah actually expressed displeasure when God showed mercy and God extended his grace to the Ninevites. A second point, learning point, is that no one is beyond the reach of, the div of divine forgiveness and the trans transformative power of God's word. So even we know right, from historical uh, background that the Assyrians, they are a brutal group of people. They they actually are killing machines, and uh, uh, even to the extent God's grace can reach 
this uh, group of uh, people. So let's uh, remember these two uh, uh, key points as we go into the lesson. So just to uh, do a recap that uh, we understand Jonah, uh, God spoke to Jonah in uh, chapter 1, and he says, uh, go to Nineveh, preach against uh, his evil. And instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah went the opposite direction to Tarshish. All right. And why does he run? Uh, we won't be able to answer that question until we reach chapter 4, actually. Uh, so we, but we know that no, uh, Jonah is a reluctant preacher. And in the, in the ship itself, all right, where God hurled the, the, a storm, and uh, he declared to the sailors that I'm a Hebrew, all right, and I fear God of heaven who made the land and the sea. So heaven, land, and sea is created by God, and all the creatures right, the, uh, that walks on the land, that crawls on the land, or fly in the sky, or, or the, the living things in the water, they're all created by God, and yet they listen to God. Right? So God prepared great fish, a great fish that swallow up Jonah. God prepared the plant right, in chapter 4, which we will learn. Uh, God prepared the worm, in Jonah chapter 4 as well, and God prepared the wind, okay? But God is not able to prepare Jonah, all right, to, to do his work. So it seems to me like uh, the, the book of Jonah is uh, talking about how God is transforming the prophet, all right, is uh, to, to prepare the prophet for his marvelous work. And I recall the verses in uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 that we are, God's workmanship in Christ Jesus that God has prepared for us in advance for his good work. So this is the word that's being used, the workmanship in the Ephesians chapter 2 refers to the po poema or the poem, right? So we are in the process of being transformed uh, by God. So likewise, uh, Jonah is experiencing, okay, this, uh, this, this transform transformation as he begin his ministry to preach to uh, Nineveh. So the transformation of Jonah, uh, what we learned, uh, happened in chapter 2. Uh, Jonah's life was transformed. God intervened. So when God speaks, uh, we must listen. But sometimes, you know, when we don't, then God has his ways. He will jolt us, he will disturb us, he will interrupt our lives. And in this case, uh, he interrupted right, uh, Jonah's usual course, which is towards Tarshish. And uh, Jonah bought a ticket for the ship, went down into the basement of the ship and slept. So, but God, time and again, uh, uh, disturbed or interrupted uh, to, to wake him. And eventually, God saved him from the in imminent death and destruction where the sailors actually threw him overboard. And Jonah's prayer actually became the turning point, all right, and set him back on the path of salvation or spiritual growth. So when he prayed to God, he uh, confesses, uh, lamented of his, uh, his wrongdoing, and then he, he asked God to save and rescue him, and God did that. So now in chapter 3, Right, which is what we are going to uh, learn today. Uh, we saw Jonah actually stepped foot into uh, Nineveh. All right. So in verse 1 to verse uh, 4, all right, I'd like to highlight a, couple, uh, a few of these words that we will go into more in-depth study. It says that uh, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city. So Nineveh, the great city, was repeated in this case, all right, repeated. Uh, again, it was mentioned Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. And uh, in, chap in the earlier chapters, we also hear that uh, it was mentioned by the author. And you remember the lesson from Carl that uh, shared with us uh, in Genesis chapter 10, uh, after the flood, all right, the three sons of Noah, Han, Shem, Jephthah, they populated the earth. And one of the sons or descendants of uh, Ham, is, uh, his name is Nimrod. 
And Nimrod actually built many great cities, uh, including Nineveh, uh, as, and even Babylon. All right. So we, we hear of these great cities. Uh, and in this chapter, it seems to reference not only the physical expanse of the city that is vast, but also the evil that comes to God. All right. So, but uh, God has a different emphasis later, which we will examine uh, why He need to repeat uh, this emphasis. The second question that we're going to examine is that uh, did Jonah actually pre preach the complete message told by God? So God says that, um, call out against uh, the city, the message that I tell you. And you notice that when Jonah stepped foot into the city, and his sermon is pretty short, okay? He only preached like, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. There was no redemption message. There was no, nothing about sin or God mentioned in this message. So did Jonah actually you know, uh, change the message of God or he uh, preached the word that God has actually uh, told him to preach. And the third thing we will examine is here is uh, that gives us a bit of a suspicion. Um, the city is of a three days journey. So from, you know, the entire breath, it takes three days. And, uh, but Jonah only made one day journey in the city. So did he actually participate actively in this uh, proclamation. So, um, why Nineveh was a great city to God? So it was repeated in chapter 1, verse 2, and then again in chapter 3, verse 2, uh, chapter 3, verse 3, and finally in chapter 4, verse 11. So we find that uh, we understand from, from history that uh, Nineveh is uh, a great city in terms of uh, uh, its grandeur. All right? It has uh, impressive palaces. Uh, it, it has uh, fortified walls. And it is a center of trade, it's a center of culture, and even military might. So it's actually a great city, there's no doubt. Uh, we also learned that the evil of this, uh, this people, this group of people, the Assyrians, uh, they are brutal, they are cruel, and they are actually like killing machines. But it seems like it is not only the hardware that uh, the author is trying to re reference about this great city, but also there are people okay, that God has kind of singled out or kind of mentioned in chapter 4, he says that I have pity on this uh, city because it has more than 120,000 people there that does not know their right hand from their left. So this is a difficult verse. Uh, it, it doesn't have a lot of references in the Old Testament why uh, this, this you know, left and right unable to differentiate. But uh, what we can infer here is that uh, spiritually speaking, so there are people who doesn't know between right or wrong. And God has labored, God has prepared, and God sent uh, Jonah to go into the city because these are the, the, the relationship God has already established in the city. So the hardware itself is one of the reasons uh, uh, why there's this relationship uh, God mentioned a few times uh, in this uh, book itself, that God want to save these people. Okay, so the second question that we raise is that uh, did Jonah approach? Uh, what's uh, you know whether Jonah is aligned to God, understanding God's heart when he go and preach the word to the Ninevites, and uh, you can see that the the sermon is pretty short. Is uh, you know. Okay, it's, it's, it's only like 40 more days and Nadeve sh uh, shall be overturned. Uh, it's odd because uh, it's probably one of the shortest sermons in the Bible. There's no mention of Nadeve's sin uh, or how they should respond. And there's no mention of God. Okay. So the city... We understand one thing that the city stretched some 30 miles based on a three days journey, all right, from, from its one end to the other end. 
And in a typical ancient travel kind of uh, uh, understanding, they usually one day would take around 10 miles, okay, or about 16 kilometers. So we can we can see that it's around 30 miles in breadth for the for that city. Uh, but it reveals that uh, Jonah only make one day journey into the city. So it seems to suggest that uh, uh, instead of proclaiming the word of God throughout the city, Jonah only all right only advanced one day's journey uh, to proclaim God's message, which God told him to do that uh, throughout the city. And also we notice the, the absurdly short sermon of Jonah. In this case, uh, in the Hebrew con uh, translation, there's only a five-word sermon. So this five-word sermon uh, has an interesting word uh, that contains inside there, the word overturned. So it says that 40 days and uh, uh, the city shall be overturned. So when we look at uh, the word overturned, the Hebrew translation uh, means, uh, it's called hapak, okay, hapak. And this word has a bit of ambiguity attached to it. And uh, hapak, uh, hapak is, is connected to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's being used in Genesis chapter 19. Is also being mentioned in Deuteronomy 29, verse 23. So there's no doubt that uh, this word means the destruction of the city. Right? So God is pronouncing judgment to Nineveh uh, that the city will be destroyed. Uh, however, hapak can also use to mean turn over, transform, or change. Okay? So as in the book of Psalms and Amos. So there is a possibility that, of course, Jonah may have uh, tried to preach a different message that God asked him to preach. Uh, that kind of agrees with Jonah's character, which he, at the ship, right, he kind of evaded his identity. He doesn't really tell them that he's a Hebrew. Uh, and he's, uh, he's not praying to his God where the other pagans are praying. So his character is a bit dubious in a sense, and he could be preaching something that he thinks uh, you know, should be a destructive message to the Ninevites. Or God could have told him to preach the same message that he, uh, that, that he should preach. So let's assume that uh, uh, it is the same message. All right? So being a prophet, we... The, being a prophet, they, are the, they carry the oracles of God. They have to speak, uh, thus the Lord said. So he preached the same message that God asked him to preach. So this means that when Jonah is preaching about destruction of the city, all right, because the ambiguity of the word itself, it can also mean that God is anticipating a transformation of the city. That means the city can be turned around, can be changed, all right, uh, when they repent. So to illustrate this, uh, I have a simple group activity uh, about word ambiguity. So, uh, oh, okay, I don't, okay. So uh, there's this word called overlooked, okay, overlooked. So in the sentence here, I want you to type out what it means in this sentence. The manager overlooked the transfer of valuable materials. Okay, so let me just uh, move to the word cloud. I just want to see what are your answers. Okay, so uh, let me minimize that one more time. So you can uh, see. Okay, so the manager overlooked the transfer of valuable materials. So what do you think the word overlook here means? Okay. All right. So uh, we can see some answers uh, that you can type out. Okay. Miss out. Ignore. Okay. Overlook. Okay. Wow. Okay. So many of you type in the disregard by accident, so okay, failure to notice or 
or failure to, to pick out something, just overlook, ignore. Okay, I saw an interesting word, supervised. Okay, supervised. Monitor, okay. Okay, so, so thanks for your participation. Uh, do you notice that this word overlook can mean you either fail to notice or you are actually supervised, supervising, you are overlooking, okay? So uh, this is an example of an uh, uh, ambiguity word. And let me just award stars for everyone and then we can close this. Okay. All right. So the word overlook is ambiguous, all right, in, in, in this context here. Again, let's uh, look at another word, another word. Okay, sanction, the word sanction. So the school said that they were going to sanction playing video games during lesson. Okay, sanction. So let's see what are uh, your uh, take on that. What do you think the word sanction means? Uh, let me just uh, minimize. Wow, okay. Okay, I'm going to pull out. I need to practice. Uh, okay, it's okay. It's hard to practice. Yeah, double click. Oh, okay. Okay, later I'll do that. So now we will we'll, we'll take a look at... Uh, all right, the school said that they were going to sanction playing video games during lesson. So let's see, allow, <laughs> authorized, and then we have restrict or penalized. That's strange, right? That's ambiguous because if the school is going to, going to sanction playing video games in the class, does that mean that the school is going to allow? Yes. Or is going to be penalized? Yes. <laughs> okay. okay, so this is uh, another ambiguous uh, word. So let me... Uh, Okay, okay, let me just close the, or ban, okay. Uh, oh, okay, sorry, yeah. I, I need to, okay, award to all, sorry. Okay. Okay, I, I, I'm not able to control the mouse now, but maybe you can help me at the back, or... Okay, help me to close the, the application. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, just close it, yes. Okay, one more to go, one more uh, to go. So the word fine in the sentence, okay. So his performance was fine. He gave a fine performance. All right, so what do you think is the first meaning for fine and the second meaning for fine? Okay, so you can uh, uh, look at the choices. So it can, could it be excellent for the first, then satisfactory for the second? Excellent for the first, excellent also for the second, or satisfactory for the first, uh, excellent for the second, or, or it means satisfactory? Okay, so let's take a look at uh, Oh, okay. Let's look at your choices. Okay. Wow, okay. Wow, looks like we have unanimous answer. <laughs> unanimous answer for C. Okay. So, uh, C. Okay, let's take a look at the answers. Uh, Okay, and show the correct answer. Okay, C is correct, and uh, let's award stars. Okay, and let's close. Wow, okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, so you can see that the word fine can mean excellent, like fine art. Can also say that his performance is fine. That means it's just okay. You know, just, just barely make it. So the, the word ambiguity here uh, illustrates uh, there are uh, the meaning of the word itself can also mean the opposite of what uh, you know 
in itself. So there's an English uh, jargon to that. It's called a uh, contronym, C-O-N-T-R-O-N-Y-M, uh, which, which sometimes when we use the word, we didn't realize, okay, uh, it's ambiguity in meaning. And when God asked Jonah to preach 40 days and, Nene, uh, and the Ninevites or Nineveh will be destroyed, can also mean, okay, that Nineveh to be turned around, to repent, all right? And the destruction could be imminent if they don't do, uh, if they do not repent. So here the ambiguity of Hapak and his interpretive challenge uh, then, you know, it posed this challenge that God's choice of the words, right, uh, in phrasing the message creates possible outcomes for uh, the city. Number one is that Jonah, because of his uh, nature, his passion of preaching maybe a fire and brimstone message to the city, to Jonah it means God is going to destroy the city in 40 days. But God also knows that hapak means change and God is anticipating uh, the Ninevites to respond, all right, to give them this grace of 40 days to respond to God. And amazingly, all right, we find that when we read the, 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 ver uh, the other verses down, the people of Nineveh act, uh, believed in God. They, they put on sackcloth, all right, means uh, uh, they repent in sackcloth, and the king even did the same, removed his robe, put on the sackcloth, and then uh, sit in ashes. The king issued also a decree for the people of Nineveh to call on God's name and turn from their evil ways. Right? So let's look at the comparison of the transformation of Jonah. Right? In this case, Jonah's life, we understand, was transformed by God uh, when God intervened, right? uh, rescued him from the sea, from death and destruction. Uh, and Jonah's prayer became that turning point, repentance, and he says that he will vow, he will sacrifice to God, and that set him on the path of transformation. And then we see, all right, the same thing, the transformation of the uh, Ninevites. They were saved from death, all right, through Jonah's preaching, and the Ninevites believed, they mourned for their sin, they call on God's name, and they turn away from their evil. So it is a reflection of what Jonah is experiencing, but Jonah could not see the grace of God actually extends beyond himself to a group of people that are evil, that are, you know, uh, that, that are brutal, okay? So, so this is a, a, a kind of like a, a satire kind of a thing where, hey, you have experienced God's grace, you were such and such and such a person in the past and now you have received His grace and, and God has added you to His kingdom. And then these people were also like you in the past, okay? But uh, you're not able to see that. So here we see the learning points uh, back to what we, we mentioned earlier. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation don't belongs to a clan, to a group of people, to a particular race or to to you know, to Jonah only, but salvation belongs to the Lord, and the Lord uh, extends okay His uh, His saving grace freely to all. Uh, no one is beyond the reach of divine forgiveness, including you know the people of uh, of uh, Nineveh, right? And and never never underestimate the transform transformative power of God's word. So God intended this message to be you know, uh, a message of destruction, but it can also mean a message of repentance or transformation. So now we, we have the chance to do a discussion in your groups, okay? So there are two discussion questions. You can choose anyone to discuss. The first question is, uh, okay, so let's reflect on Jonah's experience and, and the Nineveh's, uh, uh, Nineveh's response. So what lesson can we draw regarding the power of God's word and the potential of, you know, individuals to transform? And the second question is the Hebrew word hapak can either mean to be destroyed or to be turned 
over, turn around. How are these two meanings all right, demonstrated the story of Jonah? And how do you see them demonstrated in the world around us? Okay. So we have maybe uh, 10 minutes or so for you to uh, break out in your groups. We can discuss any thoughts or any sharing. And then we can have a roving mic to pass around for groups who have you know, some insights that you want to share with the class. Okay. So uh, yeah, you can break, down, break out into your groups and then have a, a brief discussion.